We are live and welcome back. This is Senate Finance and we've got one last thing today. And that's an issue that's been brought to me by Blue Cross, the Chamber of Commerce and the healthcare advocate. I've explained to the committee as best I can what's going on. And I've explained to them that uh, because we need to find a vehicle and time really is of the essence of this, that uh, Sandra Kitchell has said she intends to put, um, I guess we have language from Jen that um, she will put that on the budget adjustment bill. Uh, so what my intention today is to let you tell the committee what's up. Um, we can look at Jen's language, and then if we vote to approve, we will approve it um, with the request that uh, I, I guess, or Jen, that I will communicate that it is the committee's wish that this be added to the budget adjustment so that she has our stamp of approval um, for having looked at this. I, think that's the best solution I can come up with. So um, I don't know who's going to start. Uh, um, Sarah Ticho. Sarah, from okay. Blue Shield. I'll start and then everyone has a piece to talk to you about. Um, so I feel like we as a group come to this committee every year with an urgent issue um, related to something that has happened in Congress or something that hasn't happened in Congress. And we um, very much appreciate your extreme uh, responsiveness to these issues and understanding the situation. So um, this is from last year. Last year, we came in at the end of the session and asked you to unmerge the individuals and the small businesses in the exchange marketplace so that the individuals could take advantage of the expanded advanced premium tax credits that were authorized um, at the federal level, and so that also small businesses could benefit from lower rates um, because of unmerging that risk pool. So we had hoped that by this time um, this year, we would be able to come and say, hey, that's so great, the, the Congress extended those tax credits. The problem is they were in Build Back Better and um, their fate is a little bit uncertain. Um, we have heard that there is broad consensus um, federally uh, for passing those or extending those expanded advanced premium tax credits, but how and when they'll pass is um, extremely uncertain. So what we're asking, and I, I think I'll let um, others explain what the proposal actually is, but we're asking you to allow Congress a little bit of time to do what they should do <laughs> um, for Vermonters and and the reason that we need this um, so quickly is that um, per usual, we have to prepare and file our rate filings um, for 2023 in a couple months. And so we need direction on how to approach that. So um, the quick proposal is to, if the, federal, if the federal tax credits are extended, then you would keep the unmerged marketplace in 2023. So that's the sort of quick overview, and I will let um, Mike and Betsy talk more details. Okay. Betsy, you want to go next? Sure. Um, I will just say that, uh, you know, the fact that the three of us are here and pretty much united is, is a good thing. <laughs> um, it, may be, think, it may be a first. <laughs> oh, it's not a first. It's not. I think we were here last year sort of united yes, as well. Yes, the same, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think that that's good. And we have had some conversations offline a little bit to make sure that we're all um, uh, in unison here. But also, I think Jen Carby has actual language that she can, she can walk you through. Um, so yes, we are supportive of extending this day. I think we had this conversation quite a bit last mm -hmm. year. Um, we were very hopeful last year <laughs> at this time. We were, we were hopeful that the feds would do the good and right thing. And um, I guess maybe this is an attempt to say we're still hopeful, although um, seeing what's happening at the federal level, I'm, I'm 
I'm going to remain a little bit hopeful, but this would get basically give us time until the fall, I think September 1st, or, or we can talk about that specific date, but in essence, giving the feds a little bit more time, because if that doesn't happen, the trigger that is in the statute now will, um, will be triggered. And that will mean that we will have the markets be merged again. And so when I was here last year, I think you all made me pinky swear that I wouldn't, um, <laughs> Senator Hardy remembers this. I, I actually think the word pinky swear was was used. Um, <laughs> that that oh, I very mature group. It's fine. Uh, it's Friday afternoon. But that we, we when and if this trigger came to pass, that although we think we might have seen thirteen to seventeen million dollars of savings for businesses last year, and in the individuals in the individual market were not harmed by that, that if we had to merge these markets again, we would feel that coming back this way. And so that's a little bit about what we're trying to avoid is feeling that pressure again. Nobody wants that, even though we did pinky swear that one year of savings was better than zero years of savings. And I'll still say that, but you know, feeling that comeback in raised rates for the small group market is not is something that we'd like to avoid. Thus, the reason for extending the date. Um, so I, I would say that um, I, I can certainly talk to you about what businesses are going through right now as far as struggles and other other increases in in weight with legislative proposals that are happening right now. But we'll just stick to to this for the moment. I do want to be certain in this in this discussion, I know we're trying to do this quick and get this in the BAA, but what we're talking about when we do this is that there won't be those expanded premium tax credits for all the expanded areas, both in the amount of money as well as in the um, in the categories of people that have gotten that. So it's uh, while the, if, if this comes to pass and the feds don't act in the way that we hope that they act, if the trigger is done and the markets are merged, not only will small businesses feel it, but having those individuals go back to where they were a year ago, I'm sure will will feel they will feel that as well. But that is what we, we're not talking about additional protections that would increase the amount on small group. So um, I think that's pretty much all I need to get out for now. Be glad to ask, answer any questions, but maybe Mike, you wanna add uh, something to this conversation. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Senate Finance. Um, it, it is uh, becoming more regular for the likes of the Chamber and Blue Cross and the Advocates Office to be on the same page. Um, so, um, uh, uh, and, and the Healthcare Advocates Office is, is supportive of this approach. Um, I agree with Betsy, it's a really bad scenario on all counts if Congress doesn't act. Um, and I also agree, I think we're all in agreement that if Congress does act, um, that it really makes sense for us to uh, continue our, our the, the organization of the um, marketplace as we did this current year with uh, rating the individual and small groups separately. Um, um, so I, I want to just draw your attention to one tiny piece of the language that Jen's going to, Jen's going to walk you through the language and, um, and I have a little concern. I do have a concern about one piece of language uh, I think we're all on the same page. If Congress acts and extends the the um, ARPA subsidies, we should divide the market. Um, I think that there is there's language in here that says, or has made substantially similar opportunities available that I have some concern about. Um, I am looking for a, uh, a tolerance to make sure DIVA has some ability to act. Uh, in the event that it's not identical, but also wanting to be really clear in the legislature's instructions uh, that we're talking about a small tolerance. Um, so I think I think it makes sense for Jen to walk through and um, and if I could get any engagement from the senators on on that one point, I would. But we're looking for wording. We don't want to be tied to Congress being Congress, um, having them drop something 10 bucks, five bucks. 
<laughs> but if they drop it five thousand dollars, that's a different story. So we want to, and, and the question is, how do you word wiggle room? Um, okay, exactly. Jen, that's your field. <laughs> I'm confident. Jen. Well, I tried. I'm I'm the one who put in substantially similar. So you can look at it and see if you have better better word choice. Do you, okay, I don't you, remember uh, this committee. Can you share you your like, screen? And, yes, that's what I was just going to ask. What, you what you know what, you, it, I'm sorry, Jen, but can I just, I, I just want to emphasize something. Um, you know, Betsy a moment ago said we were hopeful a year ago. We had good reason to be hopeful a year ago. You know, the, your committee's action saved small businesses, I've been saying, better than $15 million. Um, and uh, that coupled with Congress's action for last year brought in, uh, something in the range of sixty million dollars in increased premium tax credits on the individual side. It was. It's it, your committee's action was really successful last year. I think I just wanted to make sure you heard that. Um, Thank you. Hopefully, we can be successful this coming year too. Add ourselves on the on the chest, and hopefully, they'll help us do that again this year. Okay. So, Jen, let's see what we've got. Okay. Can you see that language? Great. So okay, for the I, record, Jen Carvey. No, no, I can read it without putting everybody off. Okay. So that's good. Okay. I can make it a little bigger if you need it. No, no. Um, it's, it's the pictures of folks down the side. Okay. But we're good on this one. Great. So Jen Carvey, Office of Legislative Council. This is some language, as the chair said, that could be put into Budget Adjustment Act or something else, if you so chose. Um, and I modeled it on the language that we used last year. The language that went in last year in Act 25 was just for plan year 22. This is just for plan year 23. And it gives a purpose. It's a little bit different from last year's to reflect where we are in the uh, unknowing uh, of what's coming. But the purpose of the section is to allow for separate individual and small group health insurance markets for plan year 2023 in the event that Congress extends increased opportunities for federal advanced premium tax credits to include plan year 2023. And that extension is enacted by September 1st, 2022. So that would be the date by which we would need to know. Uh, we still use the same definitions we had last year that, that base off definitions in the exchange insurance, the individual and small group plan statute in 33 BSA section 1811. Subsection C says, notwithstanding any provision of that statute to the contrary, if the Department of Vermont Health Access, DEVA, determines on or before September 1st, 2022, that Congress has extended the increased opportunities for federal premium assistance originally made available through the American Rescue Plan Act to eligible households purchasing qualified health benefit plans in the individual market to include plan year 2023, and then here's the language Mike was talking about, or has made substantially similar opportunities available. Then for plan year 2023, a registered carrier shall offer separate health benefit plans to individuals and families in the individual market and to small employers in the small group market, apply community rating in accordance with the applicable provision to determine the premiums for the carrier's plan year 2023 individual market plans separately from the premiums for its small group market plans and filed premium rates with the Green Mountain Care Board separately for the carrier's individual market and small group market plans. So it's very similar to last year's language, but recognizing that we are, need a trigger, in this case, DIVA determining that Congress has extended those increased opportunities for federal premium assistance, originally made available through ARPA, or something substantially similar, and that would trigger the separate separate plans. Okay. Committee questions on the the base bill. Without then we'll get to the wording. Madam Chair, yes. I don't know if That's you hard. can see people. So I can't. I cannot. I can see four of you, but you're not one of them. Okay. Um, well, I I was I was hoping somebody could remind me of the timeline because I'm I'm sort of thinking back to last year. I believe there was some timeline that mm -hmm. insurers had to meet in May, maybe, um, in order to set your rates, and then 
Diva had to do something. So Sarah or someone could do Sarah, something. Sarah is waving. So <laughs> thank you. Sarah, we'll do Sarah. Sarah from Blue Cross. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right. The urgency is the sort of long timeline. So we have to submit our rate filings in May, somewhere around the 10th. Um, and then they get reviewed by the Green Mountain Care Board and their actuaries. The rate hearing is in July. And then the reason we have the trigger of September 1st is because after that date, so the rate hearings in July, the Green Mountain Care Board approves the rates in August. And then really September is when we start inputting and operationalizing everything with DIVA. And that's, if it happens after September 1st, that's where it gets much more difficult for DIVA to get the system set up, to get the you know, the materials out to customers to um, do all the interchange of information with the federal government. So that's, okay. uh, that's the urgency now and then why we have that September 1st date in. Okay, so help me understand, if we did this, which would carry forward basically the work that we did last year and you would set your rates and Green Mountain Care Board or you would request your rates and Green Mountain Care Board would approve your rates, what would happen if Congress doesn't act? Would you then, would it be too late for you to change your rates? So we're gonna submit our rates in a way that the Green Mountain Care Board can analyze all of the factors and then, then, <laughs> then we'll roll it up either together in a merged market or separate in an unmerged market depending on what happens. And so it's a little, it's a little bit like what we were doing last year, but in the reverse. So okay. it's a little more complicated um, and we have to submit information so, so that the Green Mountain Care Board can analyze it. And, and it's, it's math to see if the, if the two risk pools would be merged together or unmerged, but, and they'll review the components separately. I don't I know see. if that's- Yeah, no, that, that does help. So there's a, there's a way to do it that you could go either direction and it would work. It's just math. Um, I like that. Um, oh, and yes, <laughs> okay, it's hard math, but it's still math. Um, oh. And I think you're probably. I think Blue Cross Blue Shield. You're the biggest player, but are the other insurance people on board with this too? They're they're going to submit their request in the same way, so the math will work out. Okay. <laughs> Um, you should hear from MVP, but um, I believe they do support this. Okay, great. Thank you. That's helpful. Okay. Senator Pearson, did you have a question? Well, I now having looked at the language, I'm curious about Mr. Fisher's concern. I, 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 don't, I don't know what better to do, but uh, I do agree it's, uh, you know, the tighter, tighter we can do it, the better, but... Um, so I didn't know if it's time to turn to that or, or at some point, I hope we will. Yeah, no, if no one has any questions about the what we're doing and why we're doing it, I think then we can get into wordsmithing and that substantially similar seems to be the word. Uh, I read it in context and I wasn't sure how we could tighten it up unless you wanted to start putting dollar amounts on it, at which point we start to risk losing the good for lack of the perfect, you know, trying to get the perfect. So um, do we trust Diva to decide what is substantially similar, I guess? Michael, you raised it. Yeah. I, Any suggestions? I, 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 I think Senator, you you started to go down the same track I, I had. I, you know, I would say, you know, look, we don't know what Congress is going to do, and if it's a couple dollars off, you know, no one's going to. We're all in agreement, um, but when it starts to be uh, significantly more, and I don't know where that line is, um, you know, there is a breaking point, and and we're not going to be around to be a part of that, or at least the legislature won't be around to be a part of that decision, so. Uh, you know, I suppose, and uh, I'm brainstorming here, I mean, you, you could add tighter language using a term like de minimis or something like that to say, hey, we're talking about a tight, a tight range. Um, that would be one approach I can think of, or 
another approach could be to require Diva to be in the tight in in touch with you know the likes of me and the carriers and the Green Mountain Care Board in making its decision. Well, that's what I was thinking is doing something like after consultation, uh, because you know I'm only I'm I'm only I'm getting a fifty dollar premium this year. Next year I'm going to get forty five. Okay, but. I'm going to get 35. Well, is 35 better than paying more? I mean, uh, it's, and that may depend on the beholder of that decision. So, I mean, the only one I could think of would be after consultation with. Uh, yeah, and I, I, um, I'm not sure they, they they probably need to consult everybody in the world, right? Like we'll all be watching no. this, but I was thinking uh, all of you, but yeah, yeah, and I just you know I, I think this is a real we we don't know, right? Like if they just approve what we've already got, everything's good. But I I think there's a long way between what we had and what we have now, which is good. I think like Michael said, you know, there was a lot of people who who benefited, individuals but also businesses. But in the premium tax credits, there's a lot. So even if they came in, I don't know what halfway looks like, it's going to still be significantly more than what they had before this, but that's going to be certainly more than de minimis. And that's when we start. To that's, want that's what I'm. I'm so I, I do think that if it's substantially similar, de minimis, something like that, I think we all know what we're talking about. But if it is changed by a lot, even if it still feels better than what you had a year ago, I think there's going to have to be a conversation. Yeah. We aren't here, so we're going to have to trust Diva at some point. Because you're right, if it's 50% less, but it's still 50% more <laughs> than we had, a, or that we will have, yeah, right. than we had. Um, That's when we more than de minimis more by most standards, but it's, it's probably better. Yeah, better than they get if we unmerged the market and went back to, but again, markets are markets and we won't know till we get there. Senator Hardy. Yeah, it seems to me that um, having some kind of consultation with the th three of you plus Green Mountain Care Board or something, I mean, if you all can be on the same page, then then it seems reasonable and you're all around when we're not, hopefully. Um, I would feel comfortable with that if you're all willing to do it. Just, it seems to me that you're a, a representative group that you're wanting to do the right thing for a whole host of people and organizations, so. So Jen, could we say substantially similar does it say Diva can approve um, and say after consultation with? Right, so where I'm thinking, and I can put this back up if that would be easier, where I'm thinking is um, that it would be if the Department of Vermont Health Access determines after consultation with, and I don't know if you want to literally list um, you know, organizations or if you wanna say interested stakeholders, um, but, and then, you know, then have the honor before September 1st. I think interested stakeholders. That way, if somebody else pops up and says, wait a second, you guys haven't talked to me. Um, one of the other insurers, um, you know, another small business group, whatever. Sandra Pearson. I guess I'm just wondering, isn't, wouldn't it be, I'm fine with this direction, but couldn't we also just sort of say if Diva finds it to be advantageous to to both? Like there, there we're we're sort of quarreling about how good it'll be, but yeah, there's a there is a, a, the difficult math will suggest it's either better or worse, right? So I wonder if we could just 
could we say that uh, that both markets would be better off than if they went back to a merged market? I think that's we're saying, you know, they all might only be 10 percent better, but that's better. It's 10 percent to the good, whereas now they may be 50 percent to the good. You know, I. Yeah, my Mr. Fisher, um, I think given the tr look in all likelihood, Congress is going to act and they're going to do the same thing or they're not going to act and we're going to be in real trouble on, on right. all kinds of levels. Um, but when we start to go down the scenario of who might be better off and what might Congress do and might they go up to 500 percent as opposed to 300, you know, whatever, there's too many scenarios and we can't possibly there and there would be winners and losers. Um, so um, I, I'm, I'm coming around to believing that uh, the language we have here, substantially similar with consultation. Um, and then, you know, I guess I don't know, you know, probably if Congress did half of the ARPA subsidies, um, I'd probably oppose it and the chamber would probably be in favor of it, but, you know. And then Diva we'll gets to decide. And we'll cross that pass when we get to it, if, yeah. if it comes to be that way. Okay. So, Jen, you can type that in and... Yes, I have it in. Do you want me to put it back up so you can... See? Do we I, I like it the idea of interested parties and not naming people as well. And I think that's between that and the substantially similar. I think, I think it's as good as yeah. we're going to get. I, I don't put think... It back. It can get much better. <laughs> All right, so I've just put language in here. I, I wanted the de to be clear that the determination had to be by September 1st. So uh, yeah. notwithstanding any provision, if DIVA, after consultation with interested stakeholders, determines on or before September 1st that Congress has extended the opportunities uh, or has made substantially similar opportunities available, and then it goes in. I think that's as close as we're going to get I, I think that's good, and I wouldn't suggest any change, but I just do want to say out loud that I don't think Diva needs to consult with us if it's identical. But but I think the language is fine. It could be a quick consultation. That's right. You've got notice, is it okay? Yes. <laughs> so I'll just share a bottle of champagne and be done. That's right. Okay. Senator Brock. It's evident, again, that your methodology of having the opposing sides debate in front of us and come to a conclusion on their own without our involvement uh, has been reinforced today. Would that it was always this easy. We, we won't to, even go to re, we should back try to associations. <laughs> All right, Senator Sorotkin. So I have a question. I think it's for Jen. Um, or anybody can answer it, but it seems like we periodically get these requests and they're time sensitive. And it has, it seems to me that I've always felt that the rate setting process is about as non nimble as it can be. So mm -hmm. things come up after things start like eight or 10 months earlier, and there's no flexibility with the board or diva or whatever to to do things without calling a special session or coming to us and i'm just wondering if there's any changes we might think of in the rate setting law that could in some ways uh allow for a greater nimbleness and leave us out of it michael so i'll certainly defer to the, the people who participate in the process, which is the, you know, the carriers and the healthcare advocate. I don't believe it is what's in the statutory process itself that creates the timeline. I think it may be some combination of federal requirements and, um, and the various administrative procedures, but I don't know if Sarah or Mike has more. And I think I'm gonna declare this beyond the scope of this bill. 
Uh, it's Friday. Uh, it's fr oh, no, it's definitely beyond the scope of the bill. Uh, this isn't even a bill. It's a simple oh. statement. And it's, and it's Friday afternoon, so I withdraw. You got it. I withdraw. And you're question. in Portugal. That's right. I withdraw the question. I'm going back to the river. I think it's something we we definitely should, you know, Canon probably should look at, but I don't think this is really the vehicle to do it. No, I wasn't implying that. Okay. So committee, any other questions of our honored guests and uh, who are actually seeing us together? If not, I think we could use a motion asking, I guess me, um, to communicate um, that we have looked at and approved this language and asked that it be added to the budget adjustment account. And I, if Jen sends me a copy of the language, I will ship that over to Senator Kitchell. Does that? So moved. Okay, Senator Sorotkin has moved. Is there further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Senator McDonald, was that a no? You're muted, Senator. It's aye. You're an aye. Okay, I just saw a hand waving. I guess you were hitting the button. All right. Okay, that's 700. I shall communicate that to Senator Kitchell and hopefully. We'll keep grasping on this last straw and hoping we can pull out a, a good deal for the rate payers in these two groups. So thank you thank all. You very much. Thank you. Thank you. thank you. Well, thank you for being there and bringing that to us. I assume all of your national organizations are in touch with Congress about this and doing their best up there. Okay. <laughs> Good luck. If only I could control my national. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, Betsy. <laughs> well, I share a name, but that's hard, it. Yeah, it's one of the hard parts of having the Vermont congressional delegation, at least from most of our point of view, is that it's pretty hard to beat on them because you're pretty sure they're going to do the right thing. Right, it's true. So... Um, okay, so I will get that out. Thank you all. It is Friday. Um, I'm keeping my promise. I got you out by almost 3.30 on Friday, even if you don't have to drive today. Um, uh, Cummings, this is Faith. Yes. We had put on the agenda a discussion about pupil weights and cost equity grants, but it may be that you're um, done. That's right. And we did that once before. Right now, we are trying to get the school boards in and I asked them to have uh, the superintendents. And we asked them if they could send us some superintendents who might be winners and might be losers under you know, the scenarios and give us feedback as to what the schools would like or not like between the, the grants and the weights. And we, they, they said they, they needed to have information on winners and losers before their schools could really talk about what the impact would be in their schools. And somewhere in there, I got an email that said Brad James was presenting it on Friday, only wasn't presenting it to us. And I'm not really willing to let information go until this committee has seen it. That's standard protocol. Um, so we're going to have Brad James in. I've asked them to just have the superintendents the talk to the waiting committee to see if they would talk to us or giving them the option of putting off coming in until we've heard from Brad and then we can ship the information to them. Um, I think that was the end result of many emails this morning. Um, but again, this one, unlike Rygate, 
we have to do something with. I can't just tell you, I'm not taking it up again. So I'm still trying to figure out who, what information, you know, as, as, as we go through, as you figure out information you need, let me know. Um, it's still, it's pretty hard. It is to wrap your head around, are we going to do weights or, you know, equity payments until you see the results? At least maybe we don't name the schools we look at, but we can see what's, you know, in a sampling what they're like. Um, so, Sandra Pearson, I saw your hand and then I saw Sandra Hardy. And I'm happy to defer to our resident expert. Um, okay. But I, I do have some thoughts to share. I, nothing Good. urgent. I was just going to say that the, um, the task force report has the scenarios fully, um, full printouts um, for all the school districts in the state with cost equity payments and um, weights. The weights in there are exactly the weights that we were discussing um, that are in that table that I provided the committee earlier the week, this week. So you can look and see for all of your school districts okay. how the weights would. And then the cost equity payments that are in there are very, very close. They are the cost equity payment amounts that um, the JFO um, backed into basically. Um, and before we asked Tammy Colby to provide us with um, her calculation, and they're really, really close. So okay. that those two scenarios should be able to tell you in general how all the school districts are going. What's different from the report versus what's on the table now is ELL. And that is, again, what we're waiting for education to right. figure out before we start. But you can look at all the districts in the state. And if any of you have questions and want to walk, want to call me, I'm happy to walk it through with you and explain well, we'll, it. And we'll walk it, it through. Yeah, um, we'll walk it through publicly. Yeah, I mean, it's it's all in the report. And I don't know why the Superintendents Association, frankly, is balking at it. Jeff Francis should know. It's all in the report. I and don't know. Uh, you know, they were, they saw that report and came and testified in December and said that they were going to work it through with their association. So I'm not really sure why they haven't. Um, and the superintendents themselves know whether they're from districts that would benefit or not benefit. They all know. Um, so it's I'm not, sure they do. it's not a secret for them. And so I'm, I'm very confused by why uh, they're this morning was confusing and yeah. Jeff is usually a very helpful and cooperative witness, at least when I was on Ed, and I've known Jeff since he was on the city council in Montpelier. Yeah, I mean, a I know as an, time. as an association, it's tough for them to come to a consensus because there yeah. are, are so no, many- I, I don't think we're asking them for consensus. I think yeah. we're just asking for feedback to get a sense of the impact pro and con that this would have on schools. I did try and read that chart. Um, I would recommend that you print it out. I, I, in order to get it big enough so I could see it on my iPad, I had to follow over three screens before I found the impact. And sometimes running your finger along that screen doesn't work real well. So there's probably a better way to do it than that. But it, it was difficult to read yeah. just because of the the size but yeah, we my intent is to print it out um many pages of it so um take a look at that senator pearson i i just um you know this has been just a swirl of things yeah. that seem really confusing um and i found Professor Colby's testimony helpful. And I kind of heard um, this, it wasn't a suggestion. She was very careful to be um, sort of uh, yeah. not partial, but, but um, I guess it left me thinking in terms of this categorical aid versus weights that 
and and she did say the the adjusting the weights is something we can do pretty quickly and does address um however imperfectly a certain amount of the challenge we have today and and so it left me thinking well, why don't we do that and and settle or or move forward with with a sketch there but also i I've, I've come to appreciate senator hardy and others who who sort of are approaching this as as a, a more thorough fix in terms of um aid and and categorical aid and and that approach that also has a more i like that it creates maybe a more simple process down the road or simple relationship and so i wonder if there's a way for us to say look that there's an urgent need let's let's uh move forward with some version of the weight that's gonna phase in anyway but also allow you know what we heard from Professor Colby anyway was you can't just do the categorical aid today. There it has to. There's there's pieces Better. unfinished. There's there would be more to do with it. And and I wonder if there's a way to kind of keep that discussion going while we remedy or or attempt to address some of it. And anyway, that's hey, not Paul, a revolutionary that's a good thought. To but ask for the the superintendents. Um, and we also have the suggestion, and maybe we'll let Senator Hardy walk us through that, that we could look at a hybrid, that there's a lot of new categories that are being suggested for weights. And some of them might lend themselves better to categorical aid. And we still have the whole question of pre-K hanging out there. Um, so to me, and then, and yeah, and I think the only issue I can see is saying, well, we're going we're gonna to do weights now because schools know them. Schools are going to have enough disruption with changes in the weights without changing the process uh, that, that they use. But I don't think, and Senator Hardy, correct me, or Senator Brock, that if we went to categorical aid, that you might have the same winners and losers. So, and so you know, it might make it even worse. So I do want to, I do want to make a distinction here <laughs> on one thing, and that, and and. And it is a little bit confusing because of the language that Professor Colby was using. And I understand why she was using it. So the, the cost equity payments, we they are not the same as a straight categorical aid. And she was calling them a categorical aid and they're not exactly the same. Categorical aid can be designed in a whole bunch of different ways. And the cost equity payments are basically the lightest touch categorical aid, basically, if you want to put it in to those into those categories where it would ship money out based on a formula and it would be there would be not any kind of paperwork. It would be all completely formulaic and mm -hmm. it would be part of the whole um, sort of education finance formula process. And that was intentional that we didn't want to create an extra layer of, of burden, quote unquote, for the school districts. And those would be for those four categories, the grade level, um, school size, poverty, and um, uh, population density. The one category, and I, I intentionally say category here, where we felt like a true categorical aid made sense was ELL because of the complications that come with ELL and how the weights don't really work for that. And it's really a very specific educational program and identifiable need. And so it's tough because there's this sort of, the cost equity payments are sort of in between a weight and a sort of straight categorical aid. So that's just one thing. But you're right, Senator Cummings, that the 
that what if we did weights versus the cost equity payments for those four categories, there are slightly different winners and losers. And we tried hard not to use that term, but now the cat is out of the bag. Well, somebody's <laughs> going to get more and somebody's going to get less. I mean, right. I, but it's what it really is, is that the, the winners are bigger winners and the losers are bigger losers. It creates bigger spikes. Um, with the categorical with, aid. With oh, the, with cost the equity, the equity payments. Equity yes. payments. Mm -hmm. yes. And with the, with the ELL categorical aid, it's a whole different story and it's well, we it, are looking calculated at that. differently. Yeah. So I just want to caution you. And I mean, and, I think that um, we were really careful in the ta task force to be careful with our language on a lot of things. Like we never used the term winners and losers. We tried really hard to avoid that. Um, it was um, school districts that gain tax capacity or lost tax capacity is how we phrased it. And then the cost equity payments are different than the type of categorical aid. They're formulaic. They're, they don't have the sort of requirements and you know one of the things that that professor colby was talking a lot about was sort of regulation and how much regulation are we willing to put into place in order to get the yeah. outcomes that we are interested in and and these are sort of unregulated grants um so to speak and i know it's subtle and it's hard and we talk so much about language that it's um uh we we okay. sort of i don't know senator brock you can say we trained ourselves to to, to think about it that way. And um, it's hard to, to, to go back. Well, we're trying um, to catch up in a couple of weeks, what took you months. And I know is the it's simple really thing to say that true categorical aid, you probably have to fill out some paperwork to apply. You get it. And then you have to fill out some more paperwork that said, we've done it we've had you know we've got x teachers for english language learners we've got x classes they get this and then they get whatever yeah and the categorical aid if we did it on rurality how rural you are um you would just have we would just the department, I assume, would look at some state statistic that says in this section of Orange County, there are fewer than six people per mile. And in this section, there's more than 50 people per mile. And we would send you a check based on that. Yeah. So the the population density is based on census data. Um, a number of people per square mile. And Brad has that sort of integrated into his formula. Okay. And he can walk you through how he does that. Um, it's similar with the school size and the, the small schools have to be in a very rural area, as I've said before. And one of the things that I think makes a difference is that for categorical aid, they literally are for a category. Our current categorical aids are for special education and transportation and small schools and the, the categorical aid and, and Senator Brock can attest to this as well, that we heard that pretty much everyone hates is the small school categorical aid. Mm -hmm. And I think in, in large part, no pun intended, they hate it because it's not really a category of expense. You know, you're a small school yeah. and mm -hmm. you, you have, a, you're just more expensive to run because you're a small school, but it's hard to identify the expenses but that are related kids to kids in fourth grade, you have to hire a teacher. You have 15 kids in fourth grade, you have to hire a teacher. The cost for the teacher is for, you know, the same, but the cost per pupil is much higher if you've only got three students. Right, exactly. So it's harder to identify. And the same with a rural school. There's evidence, and Professor Colby found this in her study, that rural schools are more expensive in large part because the you know cost of goods and cost of labor are more expensive in the Northeast Kingdom than in downtown Burlington. But it's hard to sort of like say this thing, I'm buying this thing that's costing more. And so they're more ambiguous categories, but they do lead to higher, more expensive um, schools and higher costs. But Peachum and Craftsbury 
who are known to be good schools, I'm sure would also be rural schools. Yes. And small and, schools. Yep. And the, the, I think the category, and when you're talking about a hybrid, Madam Chair, the category that's sort of in the gray area, at least for me, is poverty. Um, you know, small schools, grade level, and rurality are all these sort of like- You can get that statistically. Right, they're, they're, they're just the, the way that the school is. It's, a ba it's based on the school's location or the school's right. type. Poverty is sort of a mix because in some cases it's just more expensive because you're in a, a, a poorer community and you have more expenses. But in some cases, it, it is actual student supports that you're paying for. Yeah. And so you can identify them like additional, um, you know, tutors or additional, you know, food yeah. or mental health or clothes or whatever that sort of things that go along with yeah identifiable poverty. So that's the gray area for me, but it, so it could go either way. And I think, you know, to Senator Pearson's point of saying, we understand the weights, we're used to the weights. I think it makes sense to start with the weight for poverty and maybe put language in this needs further research. And maybe it, in the future, it's, it, it would work better to have some kind of grant. And one of the recommendations of the task force that the Education Committee in the House, I think, is working on is a grant for, um, what was it, trauma-informed, Randy, uh, Senator Brock? I believe that's that? correct. Yeah, I'm so looking, they yeah. are looking at that, and that sort of plays into this, too. Um, so, yeah, it's it's complicated, okay. but I, I understand, you know, we're at a place where what we know might be the easiest path forward. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, Senator Pearson. Yeah, I, I I guess that's my point is is there is a, an un it's not really debated that there's a a problem to solve that that we've you know that's why we're willing to have this difficult conversation, but there is a real risk that we do nothing, and and that's so so uh, that's where I'm starting to get worried and and sort of. I I don't pretend to understand it, but I can appreciate Senator Hardy saying that, you know, there's better ways to do this. Um, I don't see us doing it in that way in this year. And so I, I, I've started to, you know, I like to simplify things and simple and, and break it down. And that's where I think we ought to start shifting into a, what can we actually do now Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what I'm trying to suggest is a way that doesn't preclude us taking longer steps in the future um, if it's if it's more of a shift towards equity payments. But um, I, I do think there's a real need and I think there's an in, uh, entirely likely that we do nothing. And, and that's both of those are unacceptable to me. And, yeah. And that's I think where I'm starting. Yeah. Something. Uh, and I, I think, though, that if, for example, the simple approach would be to use the car, would, would be to use the, the the weighting methodology across the board. And that's, I think, what we heard probably more from the education community than than anything else, because, again, it's something that people are used to. But at the same time, to, in effect, put that in place permanently when there are probably better ways to, if nothing else, to simplify and make this education funding more understandable, uh, I think is a really important thing to do because people don't tend to want to support things that they can't understand. And right now we've got essentially a Rube Goldberg diagram if we, if we, if we map this out so that people could see what's going on. You know, I, we haven't touched these things since in this century. Uh, and I'm not sure how long in the last century it was. Um, and nobody seems to be able to find any rhyme or reason or logic as to how the weights were set in the first place, uh, probably on Friday afternoon when everybody was tired. Um, and that is the, the prime problem we've got. We need to get the way we reimburse schools for the cost 
the extra cost of educating certain students up to some kind of a rational system that reflects modern costs. And, we, and that's prime. I'm also very sensitive that schools, uh, I don't think they can handle any more stress and they know weights. And if weights, you know, if we can do that, you know, to sit here and say, well, we haven't looked at these things in 50 years, but we're going to, we're going to keep working on them. It's probably ingenuous on our part uh, because it's painful because some schools are going to get more or less or whatever you want to call them. Um, and we need to find a way to phase that in. And we can't, we, it looks like English as a second language is going down as, as a grant. And we might want to try one other as our trial balloon, something that's new. So the schools will have to do it anyway, like middle school, um, that's new. Or how rural you are, um, those are new. And so then the bulk of the money is gonna be where it is now. And they at least won't have to deal with the system. And then we'll get a trial balloon as to how well and how simple and understandable the other system is. But um, the important thing to me is we do something. This has been too long. So Senator Hardy. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I mean, I think I, I said this on Wednesday after uh, Tammy Colby testified that I think that the, the, I want to make sure that we get a, a bill out of this committee. And I think the easiest thing mm -hmm. would be to stay, to, to do the weights for everything except for ELL. I still We're feel not touching that. about that, <laughs> uh, but the other four categories. And then I think to Senator Brock's point, one of the things that we recommended as a task force was to create this uh, education um can't remember what we called it, but the sort of oversight body, Randy, do you remember tax education well, tax advisory? One, one was evaluation. The other one was a task force. And right. personally, and it, well, I'm not sure why the Department of Ed can't do that. Well, they um, would be part of it and tax would be well, part of it and JFO. So it would be a, a sort of like a permanent group. It wouldn't be a, 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 a that would do the recalculations and things like that. Um, yeah. The whole and issue then we, that's really important in all of this is to over, to have oversight yes. that allows us to go back and look at what we did. We think we may be doing the right thing, but unless you measure it and unless you can report back on did it work, did it do what it was intended to do, be clear on what the intent is and also be clear on how we measure whether or not we've accomplished it. I think that's really important here. Yeah, well, absolutely. Okay, and, so, I think, and we've got to do that then. We've got to set up that mechanism. Yeah, and I think we can we can build that in. And and um, I, the, just to be clear, the, the school districts, all of it would be by formula either way. So at their end, they would just be getting the money. It's a question of how, you know, how the formula worked to be getting the money. Um, and one of the things I think we'll hear and we heard in the task force from the districts that are losing the tax capacity, the, the losers, um, is that they need it rolled in over a long enough period mm -hmm. that they can plan. And um, you know, it seems to me that five years, starting in FY24 and rolling it in over five years is reasonable, but there may be some districts that need a little bit more help um, along that line. Um, and then Tammy Colby's su suggestion about a floor um, may also be helpful. And that's um, another conversation, but. Um, the okay. other thing though, that I'm particularly concerned about is to make sure, you know, it, when we started, at least when I started out on this task force, one of my thoughts was what we're doing is we're rebalancing. We are mm -hmm. not increasing costs and spending. And that is one of the things that I think we should be very, very careful about because this isn't federal money that we're talking about that's nope. coming to us for free. 
Uh, and if we bake something into the system that increases the cost of education substantially, simply because we're rebalancing as opposed to actually adding anything of value, that would concern me a lot. Yeah, and I think that's part of what I'm trying to, and we won't know, but if it is true that there is a potential for schools to lose up to $10 million, I don't know how any school is going to absorb that, even if we phase it in over five years. And I mean, if, if they're losing it because they don't have as many poor kids as we've been paying them to have, it's part of their base education program. And it's unless they, they can cut out an awful lot of their base education program, that's going to go on the tax rate. I mean, the theory that if you know you give in categorical aid, I think works up it's a general theory, but we we haven't done anything this big to test that out. And I think some of it will have to come back into the ed fund. I just don't know how much. Um, and some of it may come out, but it'll probably be the smaller schools. So uh, we'll take a look at that and we'll talk to, um, and I'm, I gotta find my, all right. I've got all kinds of emails that are popping up. Um, and they, this is superintendents we should hear from. They, you haven't, po have you posted next week's agenda yet? Yes, I did. Then I, if I can get out of this week's agenda, I can find it. Only I'm not being successful at doing that. And Madam Chair, I think I sent you six superintendent names that were sort of a mix of. And I just um, got some from, uh, from what? Jeff. From yeah. Lee and I. Um, and I'm still looking for this. Th those will be only one sided, I'll tell you that. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. But that everybody, everybody gets to get their day. Uh, this is not updated. All right. Let's see if I read to, ah, good. All right, we've got the corporate income tax, which is the other one. Okay, so we've got to Wednesday, we've got Dan, French and Brad James and the school boards and the coalition for Vermont student equity. Are they pro or con? They, they are the um, coalition of school districts that is represented by Leonine um, that, okay. um, that they are a whole mix of school districts around the state that would benefit from changing the weights. I, I had that feeling. So these are schools that would benefit. So what we need is to find some representatives of schools that would not benefit. Um, and we may. Um, yeah, I emailed you a couple names. Yeah. And we will we will see if we can get them under um, out here and put them in. And then we've got genetic testing again. Okay, I've got feminine hygiene products on here several times next week, hoping we can again decide if this is a bill that we're gonna get out of here. Um, I've got everybody I can think of that come in. And by the end of next week, we're gonna have to decide if that bill's a go or no go. Um, and we will get some of the um, 
the the superintendents that stand to lose under this system and um, listen to all of them and listen to how they think their school might be able to respond and what would also be the best way to transition them. Does that work? Okay. Yep. All right. So, and I thought, which I told my town meeting the other night, I thought we were leaning towards waiting. It sounds like we are definitely leaning towards waiting um, with maybe one or so exceptions, but, uh, and I think we're gonna be staying with the rates we have. So that means we can, we can look at the uh, docs that are attached to the report, um, the runs on our own. Okay, good.